Oh shit. <sighs> Greetings from Podcastville. It's Wednesday, the 12th of motherfucking February. Uncle Joey here. The church is brought to you by Butcher Box. Let me tell you something. What's the best night of the week? Steak night. That's what night it is. I got a box. I got two boxes from Butcher Box, okay? A salmon, the beef. My wife made a beef stroganoff that'll make your fucking little asshole fucking jump up and down. That's how good it was. With Butcher Box, you get the best quality steaks delivered right to your door. Butcher Box is a sub- subscription service that sends you 9 to 11 pounds of high-quality, humanely raised meat every month. That's enough to cover you for 24 meals. And Butcher Box is affordable. Each meal breaks down to about $6. You can't do better than that unless you're eating lizard meat with the fucking with the German-Jewish tank over here. They ship it frozen and vacuum seal, so it arrives at your door Fresh as a fucking daisy. Do me a favor. Right now, Butcher Box has a special offer. Free wings for li- the life of your subscription. Listen to what I'm saying to you. The re- free wings for the life of your subscription. That's three pounds of wings in every box forever. Plus, you get 20 bucks off your first box and free shipping in the lower 48. Just go to butcherbox.com slash church, C-H-U-R-C-H, or use promo code church at checkout. That's Butcher Box. Listen, you will not be sorry. The meat was fucking superb. Superb. I was blown the fuck away. ButcherBox.com slash church. Use promo code church at checkout. Butcher Box. The way meat should be. The church wants to welcome Gabriel Glaces. What's happening, Gabriel? What's up, Papa? Ah, thank you for the tacos. Thank mm. you for coming. Thank you mm. for making I had to clear my throat, man. It's, it's a lot of cheese and <clears throat> there's that goodness good in that shit. taco. No, that was like six points. You're all right. <laughs> six. Those were like six weight watch of points. So you were talking in the car on the way up here that I was telling you, I was just starting to tell you that one night I go on Twitter and I'm minding my own business and I see that Fluffy, the nicest guy in the world, puts up, hi, guys, got the weekend off. You know, going to chill with my dog. I just went to Chick-fil-A to stock up for Sunday or something. And I and I looked at that tweet and I go, ooh. Because <laughs> somebody had come up to me like a week earlier and said, because they said to me, you know, Burbank has a new Chick-fil-A. And in the same sentence they go, but it's not cool to eat there. Really? And I was like, I didn't know it wasn't cool. I did, yeah, I did so not know. I did not know, Okay. But I heard it wasn't hip to eat there. Like hipsters don't eat there. A couple of white people have boycotted it. But there's lines out the out the doesn't matter. That's oh. why people that's why they do that. <laughs> okay. When you boycott something, you're just giving it more fucking business. Okay. Remember when they boy you're too young when they boycotted dice. Oh, he that, went from he went from Madison Square Garden yeah, to arena. You you ban, you ban him from MTV and exactly he's selling out MSG. He's selling out everything. So it's it's a weird psychology to it. You know, when the guy from the Celtics snorted the coke and he died. <laughs> Lenny Bias. The next day, everybody had cocaine that killed Lenny Bias. Everybody wanted the cocaine that killed Lenny Bias. It just killed the motherfucker. But you are the nicest, sweetest guy in the world. G-rated comedy. You do like a fucking 5 or 30 in the afternoon for grandmothers. You wrote the most <laughs> innocent tweet in the world. And I included a photo of my dog. I basically said I was, was going go to go, go, go get my little nuggets some nuggets. And yes, I, without knowing, I had posted, uh, you know, at Chick Fil A, because uh, here's my thing: is anytime I'm eating somewhere, I'm doing something, and it's organic. I love to to uh, put the uh, the the handle, so in case the company does see it, they know that I'm a legit uh, fan of their product or whatever it is, and I'm not asking for anything. But hey, should they send some free gift cards? I'm not going to say no to it. I, you know, I, I, I've gotten some amazing sponsorship by just being, you know, real with something. If I'm a fan of something, I let people know. And so, yeah, I posted a picture of my little chihuahua, and I'm, I'm going to go get the little nuggets, some nuggets from Chick-fil-A. And next thing you know. I even saw a motherfucker that said, I'm not following you no more. <laughs> oh, like my something about God. throwing your CDs away. Really? Like, I oh, mean, my I, God. I, I, and, and, and all sincerity, I, I had no, I, why would I intentionally try to destroy myself by putting something up? I, I did not know. I honestly, I tell people I'm more hungry than woke. 
<laughs> okay? I am more hungry than woke. I'm sorry I'm not as hip to everything, and I did not know. You I got, know now. You got static for about three I got, days. Yeah, bro. it was bad. It was it bad. was bad. And I'm like, oh my god! I wrote a, a tweet about sucking the ink out of Miss Obama's pussy, <laughs> and nobody said nothing. Like people just froze. I was waiting for Twitter just to shut me down. <laughs> oh my god! And nobody said nothing. You know, like, and it's just so weird what you can say, and what you can't say anymore. And so, I. Just, I, I could, I could not believe it, it. Messed me up so bad because I'm thinking to myself, really is, is it that bad? It's is that it, bad. You know, and I, and I watch someone like like Chappelle, who I think is a, is a comedy genius, and then he'll go up there and, and some of the things he talks about are very controversial and, and clearly rub people the wrong way, but yet still selling out. So he just won a Grammy. Before that, he won some other Peabody. I forget Mark what award Twain he won. Award, yeah. Yes. So really, he can get away with you know pushing the envelope to the next level. But I put an innocent tweet where I, I'm. It's a fat dude talking about chicken nuggets. I think you know where my mind was at. And and I what caught, I caught so much. What was the worst tweet you got? What was the worst? Oh, I was getting people saying, "Yeah, we're gonna boycott your show." I was getting people <laughs> saying, uh, uh, "How could you? We thought more of you than this." Now, do you, you know, know the reason behind those? I know now. What is but, it? What did you uh, that, get? You know that uh, I guess Chick Fil A was. Paying, uh, they were they were donating money to organizations that were against you know gay the gay community. There was you know that they were uh, supporting. Um, wow, what is it to try to keep them uh, try to straighten out the way that they think? You know, supposedly, I, I don't know. They were they were donating money to to something that was against the gay community. I I I, 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 I don't want to claim to know that I, I know exactly why, but I know it wasn't good. I know it wasn't good. But do you think that that it's on social media? Because I think like social media, they just they're not really angry, but they're just there and they. Because when Chappelle does it on stage, they have to like actually get onto Twitter. But if they're already on Twitter, do they think it's just fake anger? They're not really mad at you. Like if they saw you at Chick Fil A, they'd probably be happy to see you. I you know what? I've never been at a Chick Fil A and, and had somebody be upset with me. Uh, if anything, they'd offered to, to buy my my meal, which I think is cool. Um, it's it's one of those things where I, I did not know. And, and like I said, I wasn't trying to stir anything up. But I think a lot of times, sometimes, you know, people want attention. And I think going after someone is probably the easiest way. I went to my wife. <laughs> my wife is white. So I said, to let me ask you a question. What's the deal with Chick-fil-A? And she knows everything. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. my wife knows everything white. And she's like, well, number one, they don't. Their insurance doesn't cover women abortions. And number two, they don't like <laughs> gay people. So I wrote a whole bit about it. But the funny thing about the, oh, my God. Oh, I was going to tell you something I forgot. See, that's why you don't smoke pot and eat tacos before a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I walk in, I'm like, what's with all the food? And I never say that. I walk in here, I'm like, there's food everywhere. <laughs> You know, this is nice to have you here. It's good to see you. I feel like I haven't seen my brother from Cuba, and you came back after three years. And, I almost uh, didn't survive our last uh, our last podcast. What happened? You left. I heard you guys went and ate turkey. <laughs> what do you mean? What? First of all, you you uh, introduced me to this cookie. I think you were you were you were sponsored, or you were doing something with this company at the time. Uh, some Chiba Chew, I think, was it? Chiba Chew, okay. And then there was some cookie. And you're like, Gabriel, look at this is cookie right here. It's delicious. You should try some. And I took the cookie. And, I, you know, you don't. I don't just pinch the cookie and eat a piece of the cookie. If you had me a cookie, the whole cookie's going down. And I guess for whatever reason, it had a certain level of whatever in it. I ate the whole cookie, right? I was fine when I left. And when I got on the five, man, <laughs> I've never been more grateful for traffic <laughs> in my life because I, I I drove about eight miles an hour the whole way home. It hit me on the five. I thought you guys stopped and got something to eat. Man, no. No. Oh. No, that cookie, that cookie. That's <laughs> 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 so like, here you go, Jody's Joe podcast. I ain't eating no more cookies. No, I don't know. And I got people to drive now. <laughs> and that's why I said, I said, I no more cookies because I know you were scared for a long time. I was so you were scared. Like, why I was go on over that there. I'm not going to go over there to get tortured. I'm not going to go over there. I don't blame you, man. But that cookie, though. Wow. It sounds like the SoCon cookies we were eating. Yeah, Did it have frosting on top of it? Who I don't remember. Knows? I just remember I ate a whole cookie. Because you guys were looking at me like that look when, like, 
Like he wasn't supposed to eat the whole cookie. Because like you knew what the future held for me. <laughs> I I, thought, I did, remember we did something and I ate the. We did Chicago, and we flew back, and I took my shirt off on the flight. Is it wrong that this I remember was, you taking off your shirt a, a few times? <laughs> this, yeah, this was this was like a, this was. And you were sweating. You were sweating up a storm. Yes. Yes. We were on a Southwest flight. Yes. Sweating and we like were crazy. sitting opposite each other. Yeah. And I'm like, and I wow. sat in between two old white women that were like 65. You were sweating and I up a storm. I had big tits. I had to be 380. And I it was. I what happened was it was those gummy bear. It was those uh, the the tongue things. The oh, breath, the, like the like the, the Listerine breath, ones. The Listerine yeah, 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 yeah. ones. But they, I, nobody in those, day, in those days knew the dosage of them. There was no dosage. You just showed them black market. They could dip them in gasoline. And then what happened was <laughs> when you put them in your wallet, they got stuck together. You didn't really know how many you were eating. So we, we did KJ Riddles. Me, you, Martin, uh, you know, who was ever booking the fucking Festival of Death <laughs> with Rick. It had to be like seven of us. Riddles. We yes, 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 yes. Oh, across man. the street from Steak and Shake and White Castle. Wait, we had the, like it's just a fast. All the best choices at two. All the best choices. <laughs> it was Steak and Shake next door, White Castle across the street, and the hotel had a, like a direct line. It was an old Hindu who had porn on. <laughs> you think I'm fucking kidding you? When you went to check in, it was like some chick getting fucked against the wall. Uh, uh, and then you had a, you went to the hotel room and they would fuck with you. If you wanted porn, it was like, I think it's been four bucks. But if not, it was like porn slanted so you could still hear the chick going, uh, uh, that the old like, spi- like old spice. Right, like so what you do the, is you had to like move it a little bit. <laughs> you had to put the TV like, on its yeah. side. <laughs> 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 so on the way back from KJ Riddles, we all took the early flight. And I go, look, what do I got here? Some bread. And I put them on them. But in those days in the middle, we sat opposite each other. Yeah, Southwest Airlines had those uh, the little lounge seats where they'd have the seats that face one another in the front and in the back. They'd have those two those two sections. So we took it over. And all of a sudden, I started sweating <laughs> profusely. The plane started <laughs> bouncing or some shit. He was, he was, was drenched. Oh. It was scary. They brought him some towels. How, how early into the flight did you take your shirt off? About an hour and a half, and, <laughs> and there were two women who were sitting next to me, and I still remember the look on their faces. He tortured the these place. women. Never fuck doggy style. Oh. <laughs> you just these tell? two women have never fucked doggy style. Like if they were with three guys total between the two of them, you could tell that one was reading a Bible. Like they never did it doggy style. She never sniffed his nutsack. <laughs> they just did it through a sheet with a hole. Oh my God. And I sat in the middle and took my shirt off. And I'll never forget at one time, just like drying off with a towel. Like, <laughs> like this was the beginning of edibles. And I'm drying off with a towel. Oh. And I could feel the uh, moisture on my nipple. I'm like, oh, fuck it. He was bad. shiny. He was shiny. And you weren't, and you don't really drink or do that much, Gabriel. So like, at, you were well, completely sober. You got to figure at that time. No, I wasn't. No. There was and nothing. I, I didn't start drinking until like I was what twenty four, twenty five. Wow. So what is it like being on the road with, with with someone like that? Well, at the time, I you know I didn't know what he was going through. I had no idea. <laughs> You know, he sweats. You know, I'm a big guy. I sweat. So I'm just like, he's just, he's just been doing it longer. And this is, you know, maybe his air vent doesn't work. I don't know. I mean, we were up all, I know, I know for a fact I was up all night. <laughs> like, I remember getting to the airport that day and like. And, and at the, the time, I must have been about 23, 24. The ears were, wow. My ears were still ringing from the cocaine. Wow. Like, my ears were still ringing. And I'm like, man. And I was trying to keep it together in front of you guys. Like, if anybody else would have looked at me that didn't know me, they would have gone, ah, he's just tired. But my eyeballs were on fire. I knew that people knew I was I was on the tail end of the juice. Yeah, if it's if it's not if it would have happened today, they'd be like, no, that's coronavirus coming out of here. <laughs> yeah. They would have been like, there's something going I on was, here. I was oh, fucked no. up. So yeah. at the airport, to balance things off, I found these. <laughs> and I ate them. And I got <laughs> fucked up on the plane between the exes. You know, 
I found shirts of mine from my cocaine days when I moved from Hollywood to the Valley. I found a bunch of long sleeve white shirts because I was so big I had to wear long sleeve long. Like So I would get like a 3XL T, T mm-hmm. extra long. I would only buy clothes in Texas. Because in L.A., they don't have clothes for fat people. <laughs> you got to go all the way up to Tonga Canyon. And what are our chances of going to Tonga? You know what I'm saying? Or the fat man store on Wilshire where they charge $84 for a handkerchief. <laughs> you know what? That, that was during the time when uh, I want to say you, you were trying to put me in touch with that Big Daddy company. Because you were getting yes. all your clothes for free yes, from Big me, Daddy. me, Ralphie. Yeah. Ralphie. It was, it was a Big Daddy run. Big and, Daddy run. And, you know, and I was I was on a big cocaine run. <laughs> So Big Daddy, <laughs> Big I, Daddy I, was. I, I just stopped buying clothes. I just stopped wearing clothes. Gave you were always just, wearing jumpsuits. Always. You always had those. Big, always. They look so cool too. Because in those days, it was so soprano. I went to so many mafia auditions for commercials and videos and promos that all I wore was sweatsuits. I had a, a, a black suit that I bought that Josh Wolf bought me. Oh, wow. Three suits for $200 with two pairs of shoes right on Hollywood Boulevard. They're still there up the block from Joe's. Hollywood suit outlet. You get three suits, three shirts, three, three ties. Belts. Belts, socks, and a pair of shoes for $299. Wow. Just make sure nobody lights a match 10 <laughs> feet from you because your suit will go up in flames. Like a fucking <laughs> Chinaman <laughs> with the carnivorous virus. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> you never went in there? Go in there as a good. That's the video you should be making. Well, going into ho- a well, well, suit, suit outlet? Right, the Hollywood suit outlet. Just go, go, go. <laughs> go to the Hollywood suit outlet. I got $299. What can you do for me? What can you do I got $299. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so did you ever figure out the uh the amount that you were supposed to actually eat of what of the those listerine things one, like one little one i think i ate like there was three in there clearly yeah there was three or four <laughs> in that dog one time tell you that was me on that five freeway coming back i was just <laughs> scripting the steering wheel. Yeah. <laughs> this had to be about seven years ago me and lee had just started doing the podcast and I had one of the last weeks at the Miami Coconut Grove in Brown. It was one of the last oh, yeah. weeks. <laughs> and I don't know what the fuck. I had a Delta flight. Mm-hmm. Terminal 6 with the tropical birds and shit on the wall. <laughs> when you go into Miami or South mm-hmm. America, it's the most racist fucking terminal at LAX. You go in there and you hear, bruh, bruh. They have like, <laughs> like, like a little, like, like a little yeah, Cuba, like, yeah. You're getting ready. No, it's not even Cuba. They, well, treat, you the... like, they treat you like you're a fucking, um, what's those people that, that sell the guns, the Sandinistas? <laughs> they treat you like you're a Sandinista in there. The fucking, it's horrible. The, like you walk through the white part of the fucking Delta thing, mm-hmm. but then they have the South American wing, and all of a sudden the walls turn yellow, and they got like palm trees and fucking. And you're like, this is racist as fuck. <laughs> they have everybody talking Spanish, and they got salsa music playing. These are people that had it to El Salvador, <laughs> Nicaragua, all those third world nations and shit like that. So Miami's in that terminal. So I flew out of that terminal on a red eye, and I had a, I upgraded the first class on Delta. They upgraded me to one on the inside. So I was in row one on the inside. Window. In the window. And I start popping fucking edibles before in the on the car right down there. I start popping edibles like I get on the flight and it's the nicest gay guy in the world that's next to me. He's like, oh my God, you're going to Miami. It's going to be so much fun. And I'm like, I know, blah, blah, blah. He passes out. All of a sudden, I had uh, certs, mm-hmm. cinnamon certs. You're not supposed to eat the whole roll <laughs> of cinnamon. I ate the whole thing like I just started eating them. And the cinnamon triggered the THC. And I had jeans on and I just started sweating. I started sweating to the point that I took off my shirt. <laughs> and he, the little gay guy, thank God, he had little leopard things on his eyeballs. And I'm sweating up a storm, Gabe. And I got the blanket around my fat stomach. <laughs> I got no shirt on. And all the, all the whole cabin sleeping. 
but there was like one little light that shined right on like my fucking center of my chest. And every time the stewardess would walk by, she'd look at me. She wouldn't. I'm sorry, I'm lying to you. She wouldn't even look at me, guys. She would just <laughs> hand me a water. <laughs> <sighs> Dog, I was sweating so much when I got my luggage. <clears throat> I went to pull up my pants, and the rim around my jeans were drenched with sweat. That's how much I sweat on that fucking flight from THC. <sighs> Been, I can't imagine taking like as a big guy like that's the last thing I want to do is take my shirt off in public. Oh yeah, I can't imagine being. Like, how, high, <laughs> how high do you have to be to take your shirt off? You have to be ten tequilas in. Well, okay, no, no, drunk off. versus high is totally different. Right. You know, no matter how high I was, I wasn't getting naked. <laughs> no matter what, but drunk that's different. I got I got so drunk in Puerto Rico I wound up on a mechanical bull. <laughs> really? You can find that photo online, by the way. I let people know. <laughs> I was like 19 medallas, medallas, the, the, the Puerto Rican beer. Yeah, good times. What else is going on in your world? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, we just finished wrapping the show. We finished wrapping the show last Season week. Season two. Season two. Congratulations, man. Thank you. You happy doing it? You know what? Let me tell you something. The people, the people is what I'm going to miss. Uh, I'm not going to miss the hours. I'm not going to miss the three hours a day in traffic. I'm not going to miss the, you know, uh, little bit of sleep that i was getting it, it's a lot of work a lot of work doing that show a tv and show tv show is a lot you of work know, it takes bro. up all your time and, and energy and i love the finished product and like i said i love the people if the people were, were horrible it have been a different thing i'd have been like i'm out you got a nice little cast everyone now, you know that super cuban nice. kid i grew up with him with uh Oscar Nunez. Yeah. Yeah. Did he ever, did he ever say that to you? No, he, we were talking about you the other night. Now, I guess the same school or something. He's he's from a town called Union City. You see the Irishman? Yeah. Where Tony Pro is from. Where Tony Pro's office is what? Oh. He's from Union City. I hung with his brother. I was, you, you know, the older kids in your neighborhood who you idolize? I idolize his brother. His brother's name was Nunzio. And up the corner from my mother's bar, there was a hot dog stand. The best Sabret hot dogs, just right out of New York City, but in New Jersey. And I would go up there every day and get two or three of them. And Nunzio would take numbers and hang out with the guy all day. So what, you got a hot dog? Nunzio. Give me 204 or 206, whatever. It was either Nunzio or the guy would do him book there. But I knew Nunzio. But me and him were kids together. So he went to like Emerson High School and I went to North Bergen, which is two complete di- diff- districts. But since I was Cuban, my mother had a bar in that neighborhood. So I knew all those kids. So that's how long we go back. Wow. And then I bumped into him in an audition in 98. Didn't know him. We were up in Telemundo in Glendale. <laughs> <laughs> and we were reading for some Cuban show. And that's when we started talking. I met him in 98 on the fly. And he goes, maybe you know my older brother, Nunja. I go, Jesus fucking Christ. Wow. Fuck. Yeah, I know Nunja. And that job, I got hired. They paid me a 1000 bucks to shoot three days. They hired me. My call time was at 8. I went to lunch at 12. And at 12.30, they called me and they fired me. They just... I killed it in the audition, but I really wasn't what they were looking for. Mm. And when as soon as I spoke Spanish, the Cubans fucking freaked. They got scared of me because they were like from the nice part of Cuba. Like I speak <laughs> that gangster Spanish, <laughs> and they speak that Spain Spanish. Mm-hmm. They were really so intimidated. But one of those guys ended up being on George Lopez's first ABC show. Mm. He was the sidekick. And Years later, I was living here, I moved here, and I would walk my wife to work, and then I would walk around North Hollywood Park. And one day I saw him, and I walked past him, and he goes, hey, hey, excuse me, do you remember me? And I made believe like I didn't. I go, no, I don't. I know you were on George Lopez. And he goes, yeah, but before, do you remember me? And I go, no. And he goes, I was on that show. That time with Telemundo, he told me the name of the show. He goes, and I just want to tell you like a man that it was not me who got you fired. You scared like four or five of the Cuban people. Because he's Mexican. He's really Mexican. 
Oscar is? No, this kid. Oh, the, uh, the, yeah, yeah, Telemundo yeah. kid that he ended up on George's <clears throat> first show. Not this other little Mexican guy. He ended up, he was like a, a father or an uncle or something like that. He was a re- regular on the show. Mm-hmm. I saw him in North Hollywood Park, and he came up to me. Man, that was 15. I forgot all about it. I wasn't even scared that they fired me because it paid for my after. After it was 800 then. So you had to pay SAG. Right. Well, 50, and after was 800. So whatever it was, a week later, I got an after card in the mail. So it didn't really matter. You still got I paid. Broke you even. still got taken care of. Yeah. Wow. I didn't, yeah. When, I remember when you were shooting the ABC show, and you called me in. There was a <clears> role. <throat> there was a role that you were thinking, but and I kept saying, I don't want to go in, because when I read it, I read it black. Mm. This was a role for a black guy, and I know that that was the beginning of diversity for television. And I know that the pilot didn't work out at ABC. And I go, if I know anything about Gabriel, he's fucking jumping up and down. Because it's so weird, the excitement you have when you're selling a show and they say yes and you get pumped up for it. You get very excited and you you feel that, yeah. And after three weeks, you cannot fucking take it no more. Between the questions, the what you can say, what you can't say, what the budget of the show is, who could be on the show, who can't be on the show. And then you think, I can't wait to be back on the fucking road. Where it's my show from A to Z. And you start comparing it. Like years ago, if you called me for anything, I would cancel a comedy show. Today, I'm not canceling a comedy show for an acting gig anymore. It's too much fucking work. And you know I love to act. You see, I mean, we've, oh, yeah. we've discussed mutual films. Oh, we've yeah. discussed them. I, mean, you, you, I think you called me and said, I loved you in Grudge Match, whatever. I enjoyed Grudge Match, even though I broke even. How can you fucking break even in a De Niro movie? How the fuck do I, did I have to do two comedy shows just so, to put money in my pocket. I take That's, a loss. I take a loss it's, every it's, time it's, I do television. And, and people do not understand this. Mm-hmm. That when we came up, remember when we, the Bicycle Club? Yeah. What did we Thursday talk? night at the yeah. Bicycle Club What casino. did we talk about? We, one day. We, we can't wait till one day we're making 28000 a week on a TV show as a fucking co-star. We missed all that. Like everybody mm-hmm. else, oh my God. You, you missed it. It was 60000 the co-star, for two episodes. What are you fucking talking about? I'm getting twelve fifty an episode, the co-star, to be a hot dog man, and to be a security guard and shit. And it was like, now, I love the freedom of stand-up so much that Gabriel, if you come up to me and go, excuse me, the word is the, like that scripty lady. Mm-hmm. Like, I've just grown to hate them. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the TV ones, <laughs> the ones that you you ever been on a bad TV show, and they come up to you like eight times to correct you, and finally you go come here for a second. Every every week, and uh, her name on on my show, her name is uh, Sorel, and she's she's wonderful, she's awesome, she's put up with me and my moods, because yeah, you know, it, it, my whole thing is if, if if I'm conveying the correct message, and I'm and, and the line that I'm delivering allows the actor I'm working with to understand that it's his or her turn. I, I don't see the problem. But, of course, then they hit you with the word, you know, it's got to have continuity. It's got to match up with the last scene in case they got to cut this scene to this scene to this scene to that scene. And and I understand. But, yeah, when they nitpick and, and it's and it's one word and it's like, really? Are you supposed to say this word first, then it's this word. But you're saying both. You're still getting it right, but you're just mixing it up. But it's still the same message. Yeah, I get annoyed. They still I get, I get you on your own show? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just because oh, I'm the star of the show. No, no, no. <laughs> And I'm an EP on my show, so sometimes I'll just put my foot down and go, you know what, just for that, line's gone. I'm taking the line out. I'm giving, I'm giving that line to somebody else, and I'm just going to sit here and watch. I've, I've done that a couple times where I, I've, I've been annoyed by a line. But for the most part, though, uh, working with Netflix versus working with ABC – night and day abc i did go through all that that you just mentioned the you know they question everything you give them an idea and then they hire someone else to change your idea you know you said oh i'd like it to be like this and they're like no it would work better like that and you never want to argue or, or or stand up for what your project project is because you don't know if if you're if you're stepping on toes like me i was always like i just want to make sure that i don't 
You know, I, I'll, I'll raise my hand when I really want to raise it. But I figured if I did it early on, I'd be shooting myself in the foot. So I allowed someone else to control and run the way that it went. And uh, ABC would, you know, I, I picked certain people that I wanted to work with. And they're like, well, they're OK, but we think that this person would fit better. This person would fit better. And uh, one of the one of the people that I chose that I wanted to be a sidekick on on my show on ABC, um, he killed the read. He was amazing. He was so funny and charismatic and just he delivered and they did not like him for whatever reason. And they gave me uh, someone who was much taller, uh, looked way different. He looked more of like a leading man versus being a sidekick. And uh, he wasn't as good. Did you think at times when you worked network that it was like, I mean, you, you ever go, remember when we first started, Gabriel, on Saturday, you went into the office, and the guy said, we had a good week. Here's your $300. And while you were sitting there waiting for him to cast a check and sign it over to you, you would look around the office and you saw mm. you saw 10 million tapes with dust on them. And you're like, look at these poor bastards. Like, remember people used to say to you, send me a tape? Yeah, and see, that's why uh, comics today, <laughs> I don't want to sound like that old guy. Eh, they don't know what we went through in our time. Like, yeah, I remember sitting in the in, 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 freaking Bart Reed sitting there and there's a pile of of VHS That's, tapes in the corner or being in, in Columbus, Ohio and, and seeing just a, a room that was dedicated to, to tapes. And uh, I, I was happy that I got in more so through word of mouth because uh, I don't remember sending out a lot of tapes, but I did have a lot of comics that would vouch for me. Hey, you go in, he can MC, he can, he can do this, he can do that. And I would always work for whatever because I wasn't, I was more, I want the experience. I want to go out there because I love it. You know, and and yeah, <laughs> I was I was using my real job to support my comedy my comedy habit. I because at the time I wasn't making any real money. I fucking hate it when people ask me for a tape, especially after I became a regular at the store. I wouldn't send you a tape. I'd fax you a copy of the schedule with Paul Mooney in front of me, and go, "What the what are we doing talking about here? <laughs> mm-hmm. What else do I got to prove to you?" And the guy who busted my balls the most was Freddie Soto kept coming up to me in 97 going hey man that guy in Houston really wants to hire by you but he needs a tape and he was talking about Mark Babbitt, Babbitt. so one day I said you know, <laughs> what? you know what I'm gonna do this went on for nine months well, I would go Babbitt just give me a fucking week Joey I'm telling you I need a tape I gotta run it by the owner you're such a scumbag <laughs> You're such a fucking scumbag. I'm not going to... All right. And then he would call me again. Joey, I never got your tape in the mail. Joey, what's going on? So finally one day I just got a blank tape. And I put resume and a headshot and I sent it to Houston. And a week later he's like, what are you doing September 23rd for the 25th? You sent him a blank? Blank tape and he told me he loved it. And that's when I realized <laughs> I fucking hate these fucking bookers. That's when I realized oh like, I'm, not, I'm not playing by the rules. No oh, more. my God. This was 1997. <laughs> he told me he loved it. Blank as fuck. And that became my signature. I would send you blank tapes. And people, oh, we loved it. It was great. Well, it was great. Yeah, we'll give you the, And that's when I realized it was a power thing. I'll never forget people calling me in L.A. and going, how you doing? We're thinking of putting together a show. Can you send us a tape? Let me give you your address. And you're like, 114 Cannon Drive. What, what, what are you talking about, tape? Yeah, what are you doing? Well, we need a tape. You're doing stand-up. Grab a pen. Thursday night, 1030, the improv. Friday, 1145, the comedy store. Saturday, 1040. What, what tape do you need? That would really piss me off. If they were local and they wanted a tape, I would force them to come out. If not, I wouldn't do business with them. I don't want to fucking be in your stupid show. <laughs> yeah, but you're five Babbitt, minutes away. But Babbitt, I sent the blank tape to. Fuck yeah, dog. Mark Babbitt. He was a club owner, but he wasn't a club owner. Uh, I, I I had my own little run with him, too, and he, I, he still owes me about eight grand. You know, Gabriel, but it's what you said. You fell in love with it, and you took the ball and ran with it. You really did. Thinking back now, like, don't get me wrong, we were all running with the ball. 
you ran behind the right fucking, like, it was just a path, and I saw it. And then a couple TV appearances, you know, fucking, it just, it just kept the momentum. And I think I went out with you somewhere, and I saw the likability after the show, the, the people talking to you, and you just, you just uh, took off like a while. And, and nobody deserved it more than you. You sacrificed your life for this thing. I'm here to tell you that Gabriel Iglesias sacrificed his life for this thing. We could go into hours of detail. We won't go there. I'm sure the therapist talked to you about that already. <laughs> but we sacrificed. You know, people don't understand what sacrifice in your life is. When your cousin gets married and you send the check, you don't live your life. We just send checks. We don't go to weddings. We don't go to nephews' birthdays. We don't do anything. At the end of the day, you have to ask yourself, what am I willing to give up? Because it is a sacrifice. You know, people say they want they want to be there. They want to be on top. They want to be the, the guy or the girl, whatever. What are you willing to give up? That should be the question. And I can honestly say I've sacrificed everything. I've sacrificed family, friendships, um, moments that uh, I'll never get back, you know, to do what I do. I, 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 I love the stage more than I love myself. I've given up health. The night my mom passed away, I was on a stage. The day she was buried, I was doing a show. That's, that's, that's how much I gave up because I, I needed to be on stage to function, to, to not break down. You know, people, people ask me all the time, oh, well, you know, uh, what, what should I do? How can I, what are you willing to give up? And, and a lot of times people don't, you know, they, oh, uh, I've, I've offered to take comics out on the road. And, oh, you know, I got the thing with my kid. It's happening. Okay. Well then, you know what? And then, hey, then that's, that's what, that's what you need to do. But what are you willing to give up? Not to be fresh. You did go to the, the funeral. I did not attend my mom's funeral for the simple fact that my family does did not see me. How can I put this? Me going to my mom's funeral probably would have would have ended landed me in jail because my siblings and I did not see eye to eye because they didn't understand what it is that I do. They didn't understand what I was willing to give up in order to be in a certain place. And uh, I still haven't spoken to my brother since. But when when it all went down, if I could take it back, honestly, I realized that it was more so me versus my siblings. And I should have I should have thought about the bigger picture. But unfortunately, I was in such a rage and such an ugly place where I would have made a, a big mistake by being there because any little thing would have set me off. I remember uh, that night that my brother called me up and the conversation that we had, it just, I, I couldn't see anything but red. I couldn't see anything but red. And no matter what he tried to say to me, it just wasn't clicking. And uh, I had gotten a text message from a friend of mine, Armando Cosillo. And he was, he was there. And I remember getting that message and I just, I'm like, what was I thinking? Like, I, cause I could have, I could have been there. And when people ask me about regrets and things that, I wish I could do differently. That's that's definitely one of them. I'm 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 an adult now where I can look back on it and go, you know what? I should have checked my pride. I should have I should have checked everything because it wasn't about me. It wasn't about my brother. It wasn't about my siblings. It was about my mom. And even though we weren't on the best of terms at that time, we were in the process of trying to resolve things. And she had gotten sick before I got a chance to uh, to to make that make that the case. <laughs> And um, I remember I was I was in so much pain and I just the only thing that could get me out of that was to be on stage. And I remember I was in Ontario. I went and did a show in Ontario at the improv. And at the end, uh, I asked for a shot and I says, you guys have no idea the, the day that I'm having right now. And and someone goes, what happened? I go, you don't want to hear it. And they're like, come on. And I was like, let me just tell you what happened. And the whole crowd got quiet. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's what I'm dealing with as of right now. And uh, I, I, I drank a lot that night. And uh, it was one of those things where, you know, it's, 
what are you willing to give up? And at that, that, at that time, that's, that's what I, I gave up. And uh, I miss my mom dearly, and I'm, I'm sad that I, I wasn't there at the end when I had an opportunity to be there. I just don't think that I was in the right mindset. So, you know, you, you, you work hard. You want to you wanna be a certain person. You want to um, excel. What is it you're willing to give up? And um, I, I gave up my family. I can say that night. And um, I, I, I don't have a relationship with my brother now. Uh, I barely talk to my sisters. And, uh, you know, when I visit my mom's grave, it's, 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 I can't say I'm sorry enough. You know, but those moments where, you know, you, you, you think you're doing the right thing. And uh, that for me is my biggest regret. Because my mom would have done anything for me. Or so. You've been busting your ass. Christmas, you did how many shows this year? You do, I, and that's another you, thing too. You give up Christmases. I would work Christmases because I couldn't be around my family, Joey. It was that bad. It's like then they wouldn't look at me and talk to me like a person. I was, I was now a thing. I was now this, this personality. I was this, 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 this thing that just is on TV. It's and they all saw it as something that was easy. Like my brother insulted the hell out of me one night when he's like, uh, he he told somebody in the house, I'm funnier than him. Really? <laughs> and I'm like, they, they didn't understand. And the more I tried to explain things, it just, you know, it became a thing where, yes, I became the guy that signed checks. I became the guy that, you know, can you loan me money? I got tired of loaning money because nobody would ever pay it back. So I just learned to just give it. You know, it's it's hard when people stop looking at you like a person and they just look at you like this, that thing. You know, at the end of the day, I'm still flesh and blood. I, I still feel pain. I still make good decisions, bad decisions. I'm, I'm a human, you know, as, as a, I'm a person. But when people cannot separate the fact that, you know, you're just that. How did your mom feel about you? Because I, I remember the special where your mom was in the, in the, in the crowd, audience my, taping. My mom was a big supporter. She would never laugh at my jokes. She was more so like, you know, he's doing what he wants to do. Um I remember one day I brought home a flyer. I showed my mom a flyer of me on the flyer. She was so happy about a freaking flyer. And I go, Mom, I've been on TV. This flyer, really the flyer? She goes, no, mijo, porque I can take it to bingo and show this cabronas. Mira, mijo, it's on a flyer. I'm like, that was when flyers were the social media of the time. But uh, no, she was a huge supporter. Just that it, it, it came to a point where even she was having issues with what I was doing and the amount of time I was gone and um, and then she wasn't a big fan of my girlfriend either. So that became a thing, you know, and it was, it was hard. It was hard, Joey. You know, man, I've been saying this for the last couple of years that we went in search of becoming a comedian, but um, what we ended up becoming were men. Like I grew up in this shit. This made me be a man, this whole fucking game. It taught me a lot. I learned a lot from this game. We saw people blow up and shoot themselves in the foot. <laughs> we saw <laughs> Tiffany Haddish blow up. We saw people come and go. You know, I still remember taking a ride with you from Burbank Airport to, to uh, Tucson on Wednesday night to a club called Bugsy's. The guy would pick you up. The guy must have Big Alex, was like 800 pounds, pound, yeah. <laughs> Tell him this. Tell me the size of the bolt behind his neck. That was uh, like two heads. The guy, <laughs> the guy who put together everything together. And he's a, he was a sweetheart of a guy. I don't even know if he's still around, but because I know he had lost a bunch of weight. By right, the he time. did. He, he came to the comedy store. He lost some weight. Yeah, it was a. It, it, everybody called him Big Alex. Not just Alex. It was Big Alex. And, uh, he was he was huge. I remember every time I'd see him, he was getting out of a of a suburban. He was always in the front seat of a suburban, and it'd take him a minute to get out of the car. And he was just big, and tall. He's like six five, huge, and uh, sweetheart of a guy. And he, we would work at uh, Bugsy's on the corner of Roger and Oracle in Tucson, Arizona. And I know this uh, because I still have the poster. I still have the poster from when I performed there. And I had done shows with you there, you and Debbie Gutierrez. I did one show there. I did uh, another show with uh, Rudy and Gilbert. Um, and uh, Joey Medina was the booker. He was the one that set me up to go down there. But yeah, one fifty. Those, sh those shows, the show paid one fifty. But and a plane ticket. I didn't get one fifty. I got fifty because they had taken my money 
to split it between Rudy and Gilbert. So I got 50 and a plane ticket. I didn't care at the time because, because you were working. I was, that was the first time I went on the road. That's why I saved the poster because it was my first road gig. He would pick you up, take us for Mexican food. Take you to eat. That was one thing. Uh, Big Alex would take you to eat, make you feel special, take you to the hotel. We go check in at the Cliff Manor Inn. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, the Cliff Manor is next to a golf course. This place, it was disgusting. Was it's disgusting the, now. No, no, but no, no. The time, they cleaned it up now. At the now time. The, I still remember staying there with Darren Carter and that black girl. And the black girl fucking called me in the middle of the night. She's like, you got to figure something out. People are trying to break into my door. And it was a hotel, and then you crossed the street, and there was like a Mexican, Mexican restaurant. Yes, Mexican same restaurant. One. Yeah, that was a cracky fucking hotel. You know what? But if you don't know what a cracky hotel <laughs> looks like, and if you've in never those stayed days, at a hotel. When we were doing comedy, that was the Taj Mahal. That's the thing, like, too. That was one night in a hotel. Like, we, you, you would get to the room at four, and you had three hours for them to pick you up. You have no idea. You would get naked. And just lay on the bed. You know how they tell you to take the sheet off? The people have come on it. Right. You don't even give a fuck. You lay on top of that thing. You put HBO on. You pick your feet. You got three hours in the hotel room. You've been fucking performing at West Covina and all these fucking places for the last two months. Now you're in Tucson, Arizona. Oh, shit. I'm on fire. I, I never saw that place as a as a rat hole or something. No, me neither. It, it was the greatest thing. It that, was the greatest thing in my world. Like on a fucking Wednesday night to pick up 150 bucks. I remember hearing my name on the radio for the first time. I was oh, in shit. my room and I had the 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 radio on, and I heard performing to you know this weekend at the you know Bugsies, and I heard my name for the first time, and I screamed so loud when I heard it. I was like, Oh my god. I, just, I was like that scene from uh, that thing you do when the kids are running and their song is playing. And I was just like, oh, my God. I opened the door. I'm screaming. I was so happy. How long in the stand-up were you? Ah, uh, You got to figure. I started April 10th of 1997, and I was on the road July, what was it, 12th? So me, June, July. Yeah, three months. Oh, shit. Wow. I was doing comedy three months, and I was on the road performing in Tucson, Arizona. And I'm at this hotel, which for me, I'd never been on a flight I'd never been in a hotel. Whoa. So for me, I, 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 all kinds of cherries got popped in Tucson. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that happened there too. Um, I remember the first time I went there, I was with, with Gilbert and with Rudy. And they knew that that was my first time on a plane. And so Rudy tells me, hey, listen, man, look, you're on the road. I, I, I remember Rudy and Gilbert from uh, that show Comedy Compadres back in the day. And so I was like, oh, my God. You know, yeah, they're, they're in your legit. world, yeah, it was amazing. And I'm like, I'm, I'm hanging out with these two guys. Are you kidding me? So I just wanted to. I was I was so green. And, and Rudy tells me, listen, when the flight attendant comes by and she offers you a soda, don't make me look bad. Make sure you, you know, you give her a good tip. <laughs> make sure you give her a good tip. And uh, if they try to, you know, give it back, you insist that they take it. Okay? We got to make sure that, that you know. We, we, don't make me look stupid and i'm like no sir and i was i was just, i was i was that kid no sir absolutely not I was 20 21 no i wasn't even 21 yet i turned 21 a few days later i was 20 years old and uh sure enough here comes a flight attendant she brings me my coke and uh with the ice and everything and the napkin and i try to give her five bucks she goes no no sir it's okay oh no 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 i insist <laughs> and she's like no sir i'm not supposed to take the money it's okay it's and i'm trying to put the money on her and Rudy and Gilbert are just, they're dying. I'm like, what's so fun? And then I realized they were ribbing me. And I'm like, ah, oh, here we go. Here we go. How many nights did you do at the Brave Bull? Oh, man, I, I lost count of how many times I worked the Brave Bull or worked worked the Brave Bull or worked Commerce or worked the Ice House. And the, uh, I don't know how many uh, last uh, grand finale uh, uh, shows that, that were going to be at the uh, Ice House. I don't know how many, the la- you know, because Rudy's always having, it's the last one. It's the last one. It's the farewell to the East Side Comedy Jam. It's over. It's done. We've had a, an incredible run. It's over. We're finished. The last one, this Wednesday, it's over. It's, it's done. That's it. We're done. And I, I remember he'd, he'd always get me. Hey, Amen. This is the last one. You know, we, don't forget those the flights in Tucson and all those other shows that I booked. You for, come on, just it's the last one. I'm, I'm there, Rudy. And I'd, I'd go and I'd do the last show. And before I knew it, there was... You know, it's the Next second. Week. It's the second annual last show, <laughs> the third annual last show. It's it was always the last show. So uh, yeah, but the Brave. I had so many great memories at the Brave Bowl and and, and, and all those other venues. 
<laughs> good old times. Good old times. Was the last one. I would go to the Brave Bull and even go to me, Joey. Tonight, the, you know, the VP of the bank is there. Can you clean it up a little bit? <laughs> And I would go off there. And you go extra dirty. And I go extra fucking dirty, and they would go crazy. But I think the best night I had at the Brave Bull. The Brave Bull was a bar in, and uh, I want to say it was San Gabriel. San Gabriel. Yeah. And it was Fridays and Saturdays. Mm-hmm. They had, not to exaggerate, how many rooms did they have? Did you do comedy there? Well, they had like the the main room, or or it was like a, a I'd say about a six hundred seater where they'd have. You know, bands playing stuff oh, like yeah. that, and then they have yeah. the smaller rooms, like little annexes in there, you a banquet hall, place. the little bar room. It was awesome. If it would have been a comedy club, it would have, they would have been like the, the the store, the main room, the belly room. You know, the I'll OR. Go once music. And you never knew what room you were going to be there when he booked you. Jeez. Like when he would call you and go, "Are you available Friday night?" You go, ah, "Yeah, yeah." And some nights you were in the little room. Some nights you were in the it room a, that had the horns mm-hmm. on the wall. Like there were different horns from different bulls and oh my God. sheep and shit. Then there was a banquet room in the back. That's the first place I showcased from. I kept going. <laughs> <laughs> Bro, I, I can say his phone number. I still know it by heart. How many times I called him and tortured him back. <laughs> <laughs> We just spoke because he had a heart attack. It was it uh, for, like for real, for real. Yeah. Well, you know. You never, <laughs> I, I'm, yes, I'm, but... I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I I question it now just because you know I've 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 drank in the Kool Aid one too many times. I've 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 helped with the you know, <laughs> like no man. Uh, let me see the dog. Uh, <laughs> he posted a picture <laughs> of, him, of him with a. And Rudy, you know I love you in all my heart. You're the funniest man on Facebook. He had a picture of him <laughs> with a, a cheeseburger and a soda. And it said two days before I had the heart attack. And he was having like a double cheeseburger. So he contacted me and he goes, Rudy, Joey, promise me you'll take care of yourself. And we went back and forth and he told me what happened. And blah, 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 blah. I haven't heard about the benefit yet. But if I know anything about Rudy, <laughs> <laughs> I'm friends with him on Facebook. There's a benefit. It's coming. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I see the big benefit, El Portal Theater, <laughs> that type of shit. You know what I'm saying? So, but regardless, it was so weird because he gave us 300 spots. You know, in those days, we were doing 45 spots a month, Gabriel. Yeah, and they, and, and, and they weren't they weren't comedy clubs. Well, there were there were rooms. Of, not one of them. Let me yeah. ask you. Sorry to interrupt. How did you get the bicycle club then? So you were doing comedy three months because I remember you had the bicycle club, and there were some weeks that you weren't there because you were on the road. Mm-hmm. I had. A, How did you get the bicycle club? I made friends with the food and beverage manager who had seen me perform somewhere. Uh, a guy's name was Javier Sanchez. Still owe him two hundred dollars, by the way. Uh, he owes <laughs> you, or you? Owe no, him? I owe him because I was there was a a month where I couldn't pay my rent, and uh, I reached out to him, and and he hooked he he goes come by the the bike, and he gave me two hundred bucks so I could pay my rent, and it was one of those things where just I I kept struggling to like, like I'll pay as soon as I got the money I'll pay, and it was just one of those things where I, I, it took a while for me to catch up, and eventually I lost the room and lost contact with him, but uh. He was the one that offered me the room. He goes, you think you can set up this room? And I remember I just got a computer and a printer, and I printed out my own tickets, and I was giving out tickets and inviting people, and that's when I met uh, m- uh, my first fan. Her name's uh, Monica Sanchez. I just saw her a couple nights ago, her and her husband, Tony. They were always coming to the room, and they would bring – every week they'd come back to see me do those same 15 minutes, and they would bring people, and then those people would bring people. And then the, it just became one of those things where you know, it was – they would they would, they grew my audience in that area, and I would do shows for Monica in her garage. I would, uh, one of the first New Year's shows that I did, I was in her garage, performing. Uh, but that's how I got the bike. I mean, I got the you know the Javier Sanchez saw me perform somewhere, and then he goes, "Hey man, what do you think?" And uh, little by little, comics would come out and do the show, and he gave me a small budget to to work bucks. with. But hey, you got a free meal, you got made a couple bucks, and you know free free drinks. And you had to go back on Friday and get paid. 
you had to drive back on Friday to go, and get paid. Mm. And I'll never forget going into traffic like at 4.30, going, let me go to the bicycle club. Oh, my God. I didn't get home till 8 o'clock at night on a Friday night to go pick up 35 fucking dollars. If I would have known, I would have left it there for the fucking $35. I could have borrowed $35. I was furious uh, to go down there. Were you clean back then? Uh, you know what? I was When I first started doing stand-up in 97, um, I was I was cussing a lot. It was a it was a nervous cuss. I was just throwing f bombs just to throw them, just to fill fill space. I felt like, you know, four seconds without a laugh was was too long, so right. I needed to fill it. You know, I was saying, you know, f this, f this, this, f you know, whatever. And of all people, Joy Medina was the one that pulled me aside and he goes, "Hey, listen, man, you're you're really funny. You're you're likable. You don't need to cuss." And it's crazy coming from Joy because Joy Joy cusses a lot in his act. He goes, "You don't need to cuss if you." work clean now you'll never have to edit your set when you get an opportunity like a tonight show or something you'll just be ready and you don't have to edit you'll be ready and that's probably the greatest advice i ever got from a comic was telling me to work clean um i'll cuss in my show now but i don't i don't it's not a lot it's a little bit here and there uh but definitely that helped out so much in the beginning because i was able to go anywhere i was able to perform it you know, at noon at, at for a kid show, or I could go and do two shows at night. You know, I could go perform at a church. I could go perform a corporate function. I could, I was doing a lot of college work because of that. So for me, that's that's what helped to to grow everything. Was like, hey, he's he's safe. I avoided. You know, people tell me like, okay, well, what uh, what do you think is a you know big contributing factor to why you're where you're at? So it's not always what you say; it's what you don't. I say, I don't talk politics, I don't talk religion, and I don't talk sports. Because all three of those things will ruffle feathers, and then you divide your audience. And so some people say, well, you're not as edgy, you're not as this, you're not as that. I go, yeah, but ah, the place is full. Yeah. You know? Um, so yeah, I tell people, I have an opinion. That's why I don't, I don't do, I don't, I can't do a podcast because I don't have a strong enough opinion to put out there. You know, I keep my, my show safe for a reason. I want people to enjoy themselves and not have to think. I don't want to make people think. I'd rather just entertain. That's what I chose to do, just to entertain. If I have an opinion, you uh, buy me a drink. <laughs> <laughs> you, you might hear me say some shit, but yeah, I don't. I, I keep it away from the stage. You know, when I was coming up, I opened up for a lot of guys, and there was two people who stood out that I opened up for in those days. One was Rich Jenny. Rich Jenny watching people leave his show. Because as a feature act, that's what I would watch. The people leaving the show, their reaction. Rich Jenny got the best reaction because he was just a pure comic stand-up. And the second best reaction, this is 97 to 2001 or 2. The second best reaction was Pablo's people. He didn't curse. He made noises. He jumped up and down. Bong bong. One man. He did that. Let me tell you something. I was living in Seattle. I did not think I was the shit. I was a regular comic. I was dirty. I knew the limitations. I was starting to find who the fuck I was. I had to get angry. I was living in an office. And one night I went down there frustrated and I realized what I had. And I go, I got to work off that angle. You know what I'm saying? Like, you got to just, uh, I forgot what I was going Pablo. with. <laughs> Pablo. And I worked off an angle and I started opening for people and I watched. I remember opening up for Stanhope. Not, oh, no, well, not opening up for Stanhope. Watching Stanhope. I had met him. I opened up for him early in Boulder. When I was the house MC, but later on, after he won San Francisco, I remember going to see him to a full house. And by the time he got on stage, seventy-five people had walked out. The people who stayed were on the fucking floor crying and laughter. The people who left there ran the fuck out of there. In my mind, I never saw the benefit of that. Even though I'm a dirty comic, like I remember when I got the longest yard, I had a little bit of heat. I went on the road. I remember going out and walking through the hallway and people would see me and their reaction towards me. They thought I was one of Adam Sandler's friends. I was going to jump up and down and fucking play the fucking fiddle. 
<laughs> or whatever the fuck. <laughs> and I'm up there talking about snorting coke with my cat and shit. And at the end, they would walk out. And Gabriel, they wouldn't even touch me. Like, I would see them walk out. Like, you know, and I got to see the reactions of people. Then I opened for you somewhere. And I saw the same thing. That you had beaten out Pablo now. It was you and Rich Jenny. That when people left your shows, it was like they just left Disneyland. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like they had that look on their face. When people leave my shows, guys look happy. Yeah, let's go home and eat your monkey. And the chick's like, Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> I ended up with a fucking retard that likes a fat fucking retard. You know, this is the truth. And that's the thing I always admired about you, that it was Richard Jane and Pablo, and then you just moved into that slot. And it didn't matter whether you were Latin, black, Asian, you know what I'm saying? I'm talking as a comedian, mm -hmm. watching people leave a show as a feature act. <coughs> you know, like in Miami, I watch, you know, people would run out of Paul Mooney's show. Oh, yeah. And yeah. black people would walk out. He would, you know, fucking N-word them to death as they were walking out. Yeah, to some people, that's cool. I know people that love walking rooms. When I was coming up in Seattle, there was two comedians that they lived for that shit, Gabriel. To go out there with the worst joke they could say to make people get up and go, fuck you, and stand that up. I never liked that. Mm -mm. When I go on stage, I think people see my heart, and they let me get away with what I get away with. You're following me, but they know it's not really who the fuck I am. They know I, I can't go home and spit out my wife's back. She wouldn't go for that shit. You know what I'm saying? But when people go see a Gabriel Iglesias show, when you see them on the way out, they, they, I saw footage, and it was like, remember when Pablo went back to the village to pick up a fucking suitcase and narcos? He went back to the village, and he came out, and all the fucking Colombians surrounded him. Mira, está Pablo. That was you. <laughs> they surrounded you. You had all these Spanish people around you. You know what scene I'm talking about, right? Yeah. When he told the kid, uh, what was his name? The, the guy who had the taxi cab. Was that Limon? Limon. When Limon. he was Limon. But they go, and he just started giving out fucking hundreds. Mira, it's Pablo. Ay, Dios se bendiga, Pablo. God bless you, Pablo. That, this was you without handing out the $100 bills. It was that scene. Like, I don't know where I saw the footage. Maybe it was one of your specials, something. I saw them reacting to you afterward. And it was like, he's like fucking Pablo Escobar without the Coke. Think about that. <laughs> Pablo had to show up with Coke and a box of $100 bills for people to treat him like that. They come, they treat you like, you know, it's unbelievable. And you handle it. And then I see you on Twitter and I see how. People, you know, when you get on Twitter, you're like, I'm going to be on Twitter for the next 45 minutes. Ask me whatever the fuck you want. You know, what are you going to eat for breakfast? And you tell them, like, two tacos when I get to Houston. <laughs> you know, you got your favorite taco spot and shit. <clears throat> it's just a really neat thing, you know. Over the fucking holidays, I'm looking at Twitter, and I see these pictures. You sold out, like, Staples, Anaheim. They canceled the duck game because you showed up. <laughs> <laughs> fucking. Fucking. There's probably more people on this show than the duck game anyway. Fucking. You, they just canceled us and Gabriel wants to perform tonight. The ducks are canceled. Don't worry about nothing. <laughs> fucking. They canceled the duck game. And then Christmas Day, you went into each improv. You know, it's just, it's just remarkable what you do, man. And I'm happy that. You're right, you're right. I mean, we're talking about 20 years ago, getting 50 bucks, going to Tucson, Arizona. And with you, like me, the love is still there for it. I still fucking love it. I still fucking love it. You yeah, know what I'm saying? All, all for this whole season, they're like, uh, you know, what are you going to do? What are you going to do when the when the show's over? I'm going to go, go back to do, do my bash and do what I love to do. I'm excited. I get to go back on the road this week. How many weeks did you take? Did you shoot the show, season two? Uh, let's see what the hiatus is and everything was probably 15 weeks. 15 weeks of, of time that I was not out. Like, I'd still do dates on the weekends if I could pop in somewhere, go to a know. casino, or go do, 
You know, like a in, Saturday. In be, yeah. In between that, I still I did that Staples Honda run, but I had booked that way before the show was set. So those those dates were already set in stone. So I made sure that they. Uh, but just to go from that mindset to that mindset, that to me would crush me. I don't like doing it no more. I got to go to New York and shoot in March. I would love, you know, it's New York. I'm going in for, to New York. I got to be there for eight days. I got to shoot three. I don't know what days I'm going to shoot. I love to work, mm -hmm. but I know somewhere along the line they're going to go, we need you that day. Now I got to call Lebanese or Nyack. And say and I go, can't You got to get yeah. somebody. So I know better. You know what I'm saying? But be between you and I, I really don't want to do comedy. If I'm doing this movie... I'm doing this movie. You gotta be. You gotta do one project, and then you can do. Yeah, you know what? If I got two nights off in a row, I'll go to Dangerfields. On the upper what? On the Upper East Side, there's mm -hmm. eight people in the audience, and I'll just work out the back of the notebook. The shit that when Lee and me fuck around and he tapes <laughs> me and I take it back, that shit that I have one line that I use. I go to Dangerfield, but I don't book no dates. I don't like getting confused. Never mind the club. You go from a set to the Staples Center, I'd have a heart attack. I'd have a fucking panic attack. And you know what? For me, I, I, I get more nervous on the set than I do in, in, in you know doing a show And like you that. tape live, too, right? No, we don't tape live. We don't tape live. Uh, All those pictures I saw were like a little audience, kids coming to this. Oh, no, no. We tape in front of a live studio audience. Yes, yes, okay, yes. yes. Uh, I thought you meant live like the Connors. Uh, okay, they did that no, no. episode right, where it's right, live. Right. No, no, <laughs> I'll never do any, nothing nothing live to tape. Uh, nothing like that anyways. Uh, but yeah, we would shoot the show live in front of an audience on Thursday. And then Wednesdays were pre-shoots. And then, of course, rehearsals, rehearsals and uh, stuff during the week. And then Friday was a table read. There's a, I'm a, I'm a two year comic, and there's a lot of young comics I know that listen to this. What is it like going from fifty people at the bicycle casino to twenty thousand people? Like, what like does it feel the same? You see, it feels the same. It's or? a it's a different feeling altogether because it's like performing in front of those fifty people at the bicycle club. I think honestly, I think I tried harder. I tried harder to perform then than I I do now. I, I go in with a different mindset because it's like. I think I had a different energy. I, uh, I was so afraid of having any dead space, any any dead air for me. Like, you know, oh, they're not laughing. I got I to gotta hurry up and move quick. So my speed is, is very different. In front of Staples, it's you go, you, you got to slow it down. You got to let them laugh and then take it in. And then you, you hear it come back to you and then you can go. If you try to perform at the same speed, you're going to step all over your laughs in that kind of a, in that size environment. Um, I love clubs. I mean, I did the I did the the, the two big shows, uh, Honda Staples, and then I booked myself at at Irvine and on and at Brea that Sunday because I, I wanted to I wanted to enjoy myself. I enjoy the clubs more. I can I can I don't. There's no pressure there. I get to have fun and just I can see the whole audience and and I can do Q and A. I can take pictures. I, I can't do that at the bigger ones. Do you remember when, when we started comedy? There were guys that did stand up, got kind of good. They got a TV show, and then they stopped doing comedy. And then they did five years on a TV show, and now you never hear from them again. Mm -hmm. It used to be that comics, it was always television was a means to the, yeah. to the end. Not anymore. The new breed that came in after that was like, fuck you. We're stand-ups to the end. You know, I admire Bobby Lee. You know, Bobby Lee's been on, what, 22 fucking shows? He, st he still has that what nine forty five slot at the and comedy store every night. Yeah, you know, <laughs> he's got the number three slot every night. Bobby, Bobby Lee. Lee. Bobby Lee's been on twenty two. How many years of mad? How many years of mad TV did Bobby Lee do? He's always working. He's always working. You know, he's the voice of this, the voice of that. I mean, uh, it's it's fucking ridiculous. It really is. I don't even know what the fuck we're talking. And then because of the times too, <laughs> because of the times too. I mean. People can become stars without without Hollywood. You don't need a sitcom anymore. You don't need a hit movie anymore. You know, you just you, you got to go viral. I remember passing out flyers. I remember having to talk to people and hey, if you come out, I'll buy you a plate of rice at the bicycle club and uh, and I'll introduce you to such and such a person. Just bring a couple people with you. Like I used to negotiate with people to come out and see me perform. And 
There was no social. There was no Twitter, no Instagram, no Facebook. Uh, that's why I give a lot of credit to to Dane. Dane Cook is the one that opened my eyes to that whole social media Me thing. Too. And Me too. when I saw that, I mean, people could hate all they want, but man, no, he he took something and he ran with it, and and made millions and performed in arenas all across the country. And it was just like it was inspiring to watch somebody grab lightning in a bottle because that's what he did. And I said, I gotta get in on this somehow. And and by the time I I jumped on the MySpace wagon and, and got my followers there, he was I had already moved on to Facebook and built another five million following right there. And I'm like, oh, I'm too late. I gotta. I was always trying to play catch up. And uh, finally, once I got into the mix and then got into YouTube, um, that's that's when things started taking off. When I was able to work outside of the U.S. was when YouTube and and Facebook took me there. I remember having a conversation with you that somebody saw you on Facebook in India or something, on some country, and they brought you out. And then you talked about it. Performing out there in India, yeah. That somebody fucking saw you on YouTube, and when they picked you up, the guy was a struggling comedian, too, that they had started watching comedy comedy because of watching you and... All that shit in fucking India, and you performed or something. What was the story? What, what the fuck happened? Well, um, when when Facebook start, or I'm sorry, when uh, YouTube started happening, people weren't sure exactly what to do with it. You know, like okay, so I can post my own videos. Like, well, how does it work? You know, nobody knew what the fucking algorithm was. What you know, uh, so, subscribe. It's like, well, what is this? Is am, am I, do I gotta pay for this? Is it, you know, how how does it work? And uh, I was lucky that I was just too lazy to call people out that would take my video content and post it as their own so i would have i would have people that would take these you know clips that i did on comedy central and they would post them and you know usually they say oh no you you you'd, you'd click a button to try to report them for for posting your content and i i never did that i actually started doing the opposite because i figured they're promoting me i would tell people Post all the videos you can, all the links you want. I was doing the opposite of what everybody else was doing. Everybody thought that, oh, they're taking from me. And I'm like, I looked at it like marketing. I'm paying for marketing, so let them promote me. Let them push me instead of fighting it. Like when uh, Metallica was fighting Napster and all them because, oh, they're, they're posting, or posting our stuff up there. And they had good reason. It's freaking Metallica. But for a regular Joe that didn't have a following, that was the best way to build it. And... uh YouTube uh, had many YouTube stars that were just, it was like 10, 10 people that ran YouTube that were like the, the YouTubers of the time. And I was introduced to a, uh, a YouTube star named Ray William Johnson uh, by one of my guys at the time named Lance Patrick. He, he put me in contact, contact with him and uh, he had this show called Equals 3. And every week he'd post all these funny videos. It was, it was the Tosh.0 of YouTube. And actually, Tosh Bueno came out after that. So I ventured to say that that was the, you know, that that show came from that show. And uh, Ray William Johnson had something like 10 million f- subscribers on YouTube. And he allowed me to guest host a uh, half dozen times. And every time I'd guest host, I would have another 100,000 followers from one appearance. I was getting more heat from doing YouTube shows than I did from doing a Tonight Show, from doing a, a Letterman, from doing a, a, a Late Late Show, from being having a half hour special. So I think I I was able to capitalize by embracing that. And uh, once I started posting my own content and doing everything, that's when I started having followers. I, I get messages from Yugoslavia, from Romania. You know, like, well, I'm a big fan of yours. How come you don't come out here? And that's what built up my following because Comedy Central doesn't play outside of the States. I never did a deal with HBO. And then once Netflix happened, whoo, you know, you, you, it was one of those things where I, I ran with it. And because I, fo- I follow you on social media, you, because I, I know you have a whole big production, uh, and you tape your shows now. Do you ever put that out, or is that just for the screens at the show? Well, what do you mean tape? Because I, I I see you behind it, like they have a whole you have a whole production room with like different cameras. I can see, or maybe, maybe I'm wrong at the, at the studio. Oh no no no! When you're when you're out on, when you're doing shows when you're doing live shows. Live, uh, the reason we have cameras at the shows is because we have the giant screens, right? And we have to have cameras in there so that they can post the the images on so the you don't sides. put that stuff out no no oh, okay. unless it's a special you know I'll, I'll record i'll audio record the shows just so i can go back if i said something that i thought was funny i can go back and remember how i said it so i can you know do it the next night or or work on my material that way 
But yeah, social media it just it allowed people to not have to have a sitcom. Like I said, uh, to work on a, on a show, it's a it's a loss financially. But I know that it, it's gonna uh, you do it now so that you can stay in the mix, so you can be relevant, so you can have a reason to get an interview on a KTLA in the morning. Yeah, it's because he's got a show. I want I want people to respect comedy the same way they respect you know actors and rock stars because i think the numbers are there i think the numbers are there you know kevin hart is a big influence uh i don't strive to be as as big as kevin hart because i know he has to schedule breathing he's got a schedule going to the bathroom and i <laughs> i need some freedom but he's an he's an animal that's what it takes sometimes you know listen the guy's in the gym at 4 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, I'm just going yeah. to bed at 4 a.m. Yeah, no, it's a different... He goes to bed at 10, don't he? Well, no, he, like I said, he's I in the gym saw, at 4, I so I don't know what time he goes to I sleep. I just saw, like, Marky Wahlberg's routine. Oh, yeah. That, that's insane. When he's, when he's home, he goes to bed at 10. 9, 10, yeah. 9, 10 o'clock at night, you know? Listen, when you, when you have to look that good, this is what needs to be done. When you get, if you want to make $7 million a fucking movie, that's what needs to be done to make their Discipline. That's Sacrifice. That's to be done. You have to change if you're really fucking serious. Mm -hmm. You know that there's a guy coming behind you. That guy's breathing down your neck. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That young guy, you know, like Brad Pitt still got it. But there's a young Brad Pitt right around the fucking corner. Yeah, Brad, 20, Brad Pitt's you know, just waiting to con to convert into Clooney. <laughs> no, he's going to convert into Robert Redford. Oh, he, okay. He, remember, he was always Robert Redford. Mm. He was always there to replace Robert Redford. Robert Redford fucking was right there, did the stinging shit. Robert Redford was slinging dick. <laughs> when I was a kid, every woman wanted to suck Robert Redford's dick. But then fucking <laughs> Robert Redford got a little old, his hands started shaking and shit. And there showed up Brad Pitt with the long hair in that one movie, and it was all over but the shouting. It's fucking craziness. But no, the way I see your growth, it was a constant growth, Gabriel. And it was one thing that went into the other that went into the other because of the work you were doing. It just kept I spending. didn't say no. When yeah. People say, well, well okay, I didn't. I, I started saying no recently. But, I mean, anytime an opportunity was presented, I'm like, I'm all over it. Okay, I'm in. I'm down. When? Let's go. I was doing 47 weeks out of the year. 47. I was working my ass off. Whatever gig it was, I was down. What is your status right now? Are you a dick slinger? Nice. Do you, do you have a relationship? Uh, you... I've been single now for, uh, you know, let's see, a couple years now. How old is your son? My son is 22. You're still full contact with him. Yeah, actually, he's uh he he, he was I got him a job working uh as a uh, working stage crew. He was he was a uh, you know working at a theater behind the scenes. And it was a stagehand. He did that for about a year, and uh, yeah, nice. And I got him a, a job on the road. So he's he's happy, and and we have such a great relationship. We it's not just us passing each other in the living room. Now it's like we we go out of our way to spend time together. And he's he's been awesome, brother. I seen you grow up. How fucking crazy is that? Yeah. When we did, hey, hey Joe, you, hey, look, you you knew me when I had hair. Look at this shit. Wow. <laughs> you know, uh, it was, used to have a flat top. Now it's just yeah. you know. I still remember going to Bugsy's with you, and you had the car, and we drove, we landed in Burbank, and you dropped me off, maybe six blocks from here. On the other side of that fucking park, you dropped me off. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what type of car it was, whose car it was. I don't know if it was Ivan. I don't know who the fuck it was. I didn't know I was getting home. Like, you didn't know when you were getting home. You got $150. It was 50 for the Coke. So that puts you at 100 right there. You had to tip the bartender 20 You ate breakfast, that was 10 Now you're down to 60 fucking dollars. You're coming home with sixty fucking dollars. You went all the way to Tucson, Arizona. You had a burrito. You fucking went. At one time, I went with Larry Omaha, and this is the funniest thing I ever saw a comic did. If there was, because the place would get ninety people, right? 
Bugsy's, uh, man, you know what? Back then, I, I just I remember 75 being five. To, to me, it looked like a yeah, thousand people were in there because in those days, to us. compared to the Bicycle Club. <laughs> yeah, and then, you know, was, but after the show, they would put a, like a DJ would come out. Yeah, and, and there was people, dancing, and there was dancing, and I remember him going up to like eight women in a row, and like him getting shot down in flames like eight times in a row. And finally, like this little ugly, timid one was like, I don't know. And she's <laughs> and I was sitting there watching this whole thing. I saw the creepiest things go down at that place. But here we are, brother, 20 years later. And uh, I'm happy you took the time to came up and say hello. You know, I miss you. And it's great to see all your success. And I always break your balls on Twitter or whatever. Yeah, I know. <laughs> But for, there's not a lot of people that I can say I go back with that I still have a good relationship with. Yeah, no, no, no. Because no, with you with, with time and with growth and change, some people don't handle it well. Some people don't handle change well. Some people don't handle growth well. Some people can only grow and 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 when I say grow, I don't, I, you know, uh, there's a way whether it's work ethics or whether it's you know you said earlier about becoming a man. Like, you know, what did it take? I mean, I, there was a lot of pain want to get to a certain place and, and some people will stay that way and, and not learn from it. And there's some people that, that can grow past it. And I feel like I've, I've gone through so much over the years and I appreciate the fact that you've always been, you've always been you. And if there was anything, if, if I had ever did anything that, uh, that required calling out you, you were the first to do it. And there was always a respect that, you know, Hey, uncle, uncle Joey said, and you know, like Martin would call me up, hey man, Uncle Joe has some questions. Oh shit, here we go, and I get nervous because I'm like, I, I saw you very much like a, a parental figure, where it was like, ah, man, what what did I do? I got to ask Martin. It's like I don't know, man, but he he wants to know. Oh shit, all right, here we go. Oh, so that, that there's always been that respect and that love there for you, and I'll never forget that one night we were at the comedy store, and it was uh, it was it was Marilyn's, you know, uh, like funeral and. And then Jeff Valdez went up there, and I'm like, "Oh my God!" And I witnessed, uh, yeah, I, I saw, I saw the, the side of Joey that I never wanted to be in front of. <laughs> I saw, I saw those flames directed at, at someone, and it wasn't me. And I was, I was never more happy <laughs> that, that that I was never on your bad side. Because you know, uh, Gabriel, I'm trying to write a joke right now, comparing a, a wake to Hollywood. Like, I saw my mother get buried, and I went to this wake. And Cuban wakes are five days, four days fucking long. You know, the, the arm has to pop up before they bury her. They, I swear to God, <laughs> Cuban, <laughs> something's got to move before they bury him. So I saw these people come into this wake, and everybody told me if I ever needed anything to call them. And a month later when I called him, the phone was disconnected. Mm. You know, so I've always had a big problem with wakes. Like, I just don't fucking like them. So I walk in there that day. See, there's a backstory to the Jeff Valdez thing. You know that he tortured me in Maryland for years. And that thing that he did to me with the Latino Laugh Festival, I never, ever forgot that. Because he made me showcase like a donkey five times, clean. And then he said, you didn't make it to the festival. But then he did a midnight blue show. Mm -hmm. And he didn't ask me to do the dirty show. And I saw him at the, he came to the store on purpose that Monday night, like to rub it in my face. And I was like, that's a declaration of war. <laughs> but I'll save that for later down the road. That's how crazy I am. So this is 98. And I saved it as a declaration of war <laughs> that showed back up yeah. in 2007. Like, I always knew I was going to stab him one way or another. I'm, I'm looking at you in the face, and I'm telling you that that whole thing, how to describe to comedians what it felt like, it was a time in my life where I couldn't find an agent. I was booking shit. I booked the CBS pilot. I booked basketball, and I had booked something else. Everybody was had agents. Everybody was going to Montreal. Everybody was getting something. And here I am stuck at the store following Paul Mooney every night. And I didn't really see it for what it was. Do you know what I'm saying, dog? Mm -hmm. So here I am 
living my life. I never bothered the Latin community. In 2000, in, in 1996, they called me in Seattle and flew me down and put me in a hotel in Wilshire and took me to the Laugh Factory and made me go up number six behind Greg Giraldo and fucking wow. Pop. This is when Pablo was a fucking pure yes. hell. This is when Pablo was doing Seinfeld in Spanish. And once I saw that, my insides broke. I'm like, I don't deserve to be down here. So I went up. They put me up like number fucking two. I'm a Cuban guy in an all Mexican room. I get fucking buried. I get off stage. There was one person who came up to me and gave me a hug. Marilyn Martinez came up to me. She goes, that's the funniest thing I ever saw in my life. <laughs> These steps just don't fucking get it. They don't understand. Fuck them. They have a broom up their fucking pussies. You know, like, she would just go off into like this thing. That's how I met Marilyn Martinez was after bombing my first time ever in L.A. <laughs> and getting off the stage and her going off and taking me outside and telling me to move here, that I should be on the next plane down here, that they're looking for guys like me. And I remember taking her number. And I went back to Seattle kept in touch with Marilyn, mm -hmm. and then I got the deal from CBS, and when I came back, I called Marilyn, and she told me, come to the store, I'll introduce you to Mitzi, the whole fucking thing. I mean, it was just mind-boggling how nice of a lady she was. She had the black husband, David. 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 Always had those mints in his pocket? Yeah. <laughs> I could, I could always depend on David to have it hand me a mint. Just, it was just a weird, yeah. I don't know what she was to you and me. She was like, she went off on you. She went off on me. You know, it was like, a, she was like an she angel. She would go off on me for bad relationship choices because I would always tell her what was going on. You're stupid. You know, she would tell me some nasty things I should be doing instead of trying to be romantic. <laughs> David, give him a mint. <laughs> I'm like, oh my god. I, uh, it's funny. I don't. I have a picture of her on my uh, on my clipboard. It's like I have a clipboard on the wall, and I mm -hmm. just look at it. And whenever I see it, I just think of her. Say, she would call the house dog. And if I didn't pick up, remember the old answer answering machine? machine. Pick up, pick up, pick up. Hello, I know you're there. She would say, "Cocksucker." And my girlfriend would go, what kind of people do you hang out with? Like, that's when I first started dating Terry. And Marilyn would call the house. We'd leave the store at 2. You went to Santa Monica. You got a chicken burrito. You just talked there till about quarter to 3. And then you went home. And a half hour later, your phone's ringing. It's Marilyn. And all of a sudden, she go, I got to go. There's a guy calling me for phone sex. And then she would go get a phone sex guy. <laughs> And, and I'd be sitting there snorting blow, and all of a sudden my phone would ring. What's up? Fuck him. He wanted me to stick a broomstick up my pussy. <laughs> like she would say all this shit to you. And you and I'd be coked up, Gabriel. I'd be five in the morning coked up. And you've talked about Marilyn before that you know the people know that she's she used to be a, a phone sex yes. operator back in the day. Those nine seven six days in the now, late you gotta remember 90s. Marilyn was five foot four. Three hundred. <laughs> Three seventy eight. <laughs> well, she had one of those. And that's not the shoes. Her head looked like you got hit with a safe. Like somebody <laughs> dropped a safe from the eleventh floor. God rest her soul. I'm not saying nothing bad about her. I miss her dearly. I couldn't even imagine her around today. Like on oh a wow, I couldn't even imagine her around tipping the scales at four hundred eating on a podcast, talking dirty shit about people. Because by this time, she would have been fucking gone. She would have still been talking shit about poetry. <laughs> <laughs> God rest his soul. Yeah, she was not for the sensitive. Yeah, her... <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it was weird that she was a phone sex operator. And she told me that she would remember her character was Miko. Miko. I'm a Japanese. Yeah, she's Japanese. She was Mexican. <laughs> she would play Miko and something else. 
And then she would she oh. grab her cheek and she said, I was so wet. And she do the little. <laughs> oh, my God. This is how she paid the bills? Yes. Yes. Oh, my God. And I remember going on the road with them and going to the hotel room where they had a cooler filled with licorice and <laughs> candies. They were like walking diabetes. It was It was tremendous. It was tremendous. It was like having a mom, but not really. She was a comedy fucking chick, man. I she was, was awesome. She's been dead for 12 years now. Oh, wow. Because that's how long I've been clean. She died the week I decided to get clean. So that's what I'm trying to say to you. Jeff Valdez caught a beating. Eight years later, I waited in the bushes. <laughs> like, like, what's his name in the beginning of fucking? Oh my God. <laughs> what's his name in the beginning of Apocalypse Now? Remember when he takes the head of ass and he's naked in his room? Charlie Sheen's father. Martin. Oh, my Martin. God. I'm like Martin Sheen. Remember he says, right now I'm in this room getting weaker while Charlie's in the bush getting stronger. <laughs> I was just Charlie in the bush getting stronger. And I always knew I was going to light Valdez up for that night. He broke me. Like, it didn't matter what else was going on in my life. Like, it didn't matter I was poor. It didn't matter that I didn't have a fucking theatrical agent. It didn't matter that nobody wanted to sign me. That, none of that shit mattered. You couldn't give me a spot in a dirty show at the festival. I never forgave him for that. And how he switched it up that week after he humiliated me like four or five times. The following year, he sent us down there and he paid us with a I remember check. it was you and Marilyn. Me, yeah. Marilyn, and then just because he sent me down there didn't mean I forgave him. <laughs> I always kept that in the back of my mind, and it was always going to be a smack to the face, at least. I knew it was going to be a smack to the face. So I let it, whatever. I picked up the longest yard. They called me. They tried to run a scam by me. <clears throat> First, they called with a number, and I said, go fuck yourself. Then they called back with the number I asked for, like, that easy. Like, all of a sudden, I was fucking Bill Cosby. I'm the hottest act. Like, just they, they just weren't right. Something wasn't right. And then they did that last festival where everybody bowed out of. And they did the theater. Jeff Valdez did the theater on Hollywood Boulevard. I was still living in Hollywood. He kept calling me going, come on, come over and do the theater. It doesn't pay anything. But he's charging $55 at the door. He's not paying anything. And I, and I was over it already. I was over the whole Latin scene. That sh that ship had fucking sailed. sailed and went, like the whole 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 thing had gone. It was broken, and all of a sudden, the thing I fucking hate the most happened. A friend of mine dies. So at the time, I know he was giving her work. Remember, they were doing that TV sh sh show about her working with kids. Yeah, this uh, was it a show on, like CTV, with the. Yes. He was paying her like 500 bucks. I'm not mad at him for that. I was mad at him for what he put us through. Because not only was I heartbroken, but Marilyn cried. Marilyn cried to me saying that the reason why she didn't get it was because she wasn't pretty and shit. And I just never forgot that night. And I just knew he was going to get it. And all of a sudden, God forbid... Eight years later, Marilyn Martinez is dead. I get off the plane from New York. I haven't done coke all weekend. So I was four days into wrestling with the no coke thing. I get back. Uh, there's going to be a wake. My cat dies. I make a fucking promise that I'm not going to snort coke if the other cat lives. And all of a sudden, we have to go to church for Marilyn Martinez. And I parked the car. I was maybe 390 at the time. And I was taking Kung Fu in Silver Lake with some fucking... Joey Karate. With, that was how Joey, Joey Karate, Karate became. Okay. And I'll never forget parking the car, going in and seeing Jeff Valdez by the church. And my blood pressure went up from 100 to 190. And I said, hello, I was called you. And there was drama going on. Who was going to pay for the funeral? Marilyn's husband couldn't afford the funeral. 
Some people said they were going to pay for the funeral, but if certain people showed up, they weren't going to pay for the funeral. So David was all stressed out. I, I was living in a fucking apartment. I could barely make $700 a month rent. I couldn't help out. I felt horrible. So I knew all this bad energy was going on. So you know me. You know I'm hot-headed. And at that time, I had the drugs going on. So I could, I could hit you with a dish. I threw a bottle at some guy at the comedy store. I used, you know, I was doing shit that junkies do. You know what I'm saying? I was doing junkie shit. So I bowed out of that thing at the comedy store. That church thing was at 10 o'clock a.m. I saw Jeff there at like 11, and my blood pressure started going up. I went home, and I said, I'm going to stay home and mind my business. I even took a sleeping pill. I took a sleeping pill so I wouldn't do coke. It would have been like the seventh day that I would have been clean from coke. And I was already burning the fuck up, and now my best friend dies. Somebody who calls me every night and calls me cocksucker and all this shit. And I go, fuck this. My friend, a friend of mine who's not my friend no more because she started drinking again and lost her fucking mind, called me up and she goes, listen, I'm not going to tell you how to live your life. She was your friend. If you don't go, it's going to look bad. And I go, you know what? You're absolutely right. And I fucking went there, but I stopped. I got $60 out of the ATM in Sunset. And I went to the dealer's house and I bought a gram of Coke and I put it in my drug pocket. And I go, I'm going to go down there and I'm going to fucking do whatever they were having. Like a, uh, Now, you were there. At, at the store, yeah. At the store when we had a talk. You were there. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I walk in. Because then Ludovica got naked too. Right, that? Ludovica yeah. showed up. No, but that time they had sent me home. Oh. I was banned from the building and shit like that. And by the way, I didn't get banned for that. Mitzi Shore called me. I told her the truth. And she goes, fuck him. I didn't like him anyway. He's a greasy motherfucker or something. So I was like, whoof. I risked that bullet. And when I go in there, I make the turn. Now, I'm clean off coke for seven days. I'm pissed off about that. I'm pissed off because they offered me a movie. And the people said to me, excuse me, before you accept the movie, we want you to think about it. Because you know we, we know you have a drug habit. I was oh, pissed wow. about that. I was pissed about Marilyn. I was pissed about everything in my fucking life wasn't going the right way. And I walk into the comedy store main room, and there's a buffet for Marilyn's death. There was a line of food in the back that Corey Cuomo had put together, Freddie Soto's wife. wife. God rest his soul. And who was eating the free food but Jeff Valdez? That was the ultimate insult where I come from. I knew I had a stab in the fucking neck. <laughs> I went in. I didn't even have time to, to snort the coke. I swear to God. I went in and I got a... Like a do is on the rocks. And I drank it. And I walked. And my blood pressure, my heart was pounding. I didn't know if I was going to hit him. And all of a sudden, they stopped me. And they go, hey, we're going we're gonna to start this thing. I don't care if you're three or 75. <laughs> we still got it, dog. Still- That's all that matters. You know what? Fuck the story. We're we'll into with that because this is pure shit that's coming out of my head. <laughs> this, this is, look at him. Look at him. He's turning purple. This is the third time he's on oh me. Oh my god. <laughs> Oh, and that one sounded wet. There's no oh. And you don't wear underwear. Yeah. There's no way you're... you're no, I got underwear on. Trust <laughs> oh, me. God. I'm 57. I went down that road already. <laughs> I went home one day. I swear to God, about a month ago, I just went to wipe my ass and found a little piece of shit. <laughs> I didn't question. Maybe I made a mistake. I didn't know how I got there. About a week later, again, my ass was a little burning. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> I go back to this like a little fucking, what do you call, oh, like a milk dud. Like, oh, wow. So, yeah, I got like little milk duds. Like, I'm losing like people. Pretty soon I got to wear a diaper. I'm like two months away from wearing a diaper. So I might as well have some fun now. 
<laughs> shit my pants. You got to shit your pants, pull over, and then you drive a little bit and throw them out the window. You can't even do that now because now, now the you're cops. Littering. No, the cops will bring it in, check your twenty three and me, and all of a sudden there you are at home jerking off, watching TV, and the cops come with your baggy with your with your fucking me undies on. And they're like, listen, we found your fucking sperm in here. Oh, God. And uh, by the way, you're not Mexican. (laughs) (laughs) Gabriel Iglesias, thank you. for Anything you want to tell us? What season date? Anything? Uh, They haven't given me any information. What's the uh, name of this tour? uh, The name of the tour is Beyond the Fluffy. Fuck it. Fuck it. God bless you. Beyond the Fluffy. It's been an honor to know you. Fucking 20 years. I've seen you grow up. In front of me. I'm an old man. I'm 57 next Wednesday. Wow. Happy birthday. Wow. Happy birthday. This is a nice present for myself. Fucking uh, Gabriel. Let's Columbus. check them drawers. <laughs> no, you don't need to check those drawers. Now we need those fucking potato tacos. That, and they fucking Joe Malash probably ate them more. Him and the other kid who couldn't wait oh. to get their hands on them. Thank you very much for coming on, guys. Love you, Joey. Love you, brother. <laughs> All right, don't forget, you dirty motherfuckers. They had an extra show in Tempe on Thursday night, 10-15. And on the 27th or 28th of February, I'll be at Treasure Island in Las Vegas. Check the fucking schedule. I took the 28th. Before we leave, like I said, this is brought to you by Butcher Box. I am in love with this. What's the best night of the week? Steak night followed by mama letting you get a little sniff, a little whiff. Listen to me. (laughs) This meat is fucking tremendous. Like I said, they vacuum seal it. They deliver it right to your door. It's fresh, whether you get the salmon, the the, the, the the steaks. I mean, they sent ground beef. Everything was fucking first class. With Butcher Box, you get the best quality steaks delivered right to your door. Butcher Box is a subscription service that sends you 9 to 11 pounds of high quality you mainly raise meat every month. That's enough to cover you for 24 meals. And Butcher Box is affordable. Each meal breaks down to about $6. They ship it frozen and then vacuum sealed, and it arrives at your door fresh as a fucking little monkey in the morning. Ooh. You choose what you get. You can customize every order with healthy, high-quality meats like grass-fed beef, free-range chicken, heritage pork, and wild-caught salmon. The salmon was fucking to die for. Or pick one of the curated collections and let Butcher Box do all the work for you. Right now, Butcher Box is a special offer. What we're going to do is this. We're going to give you free wings for the life of your subscription. Did you hear what I'm saying to you? Not those little fucking HIV wings. I'm talking about fucking wings. That's three pounds of wings in every box forever. Plus, you get 20 bucks off, 20 bucks off your first box and free shipping in the lower 48. Do me a favor. Check this out. You're not going to believe it. Go to ButcherBox.com slash church. Use promo code church at checkout. That's ButcherBox.com slash church. Or use promo code church at checkout. ButcherBox. The way meat should be. And I want to thank my man Gabriel Iglesias for coming down. And I want to thank the Flying Jew. Or AKA the Christ Killer. But most importantly, I want to thank you motherfuckers. For support me. I'll see you guys at Tempe. If not, I'll see you next fucking Tuesday morning. Ready to go. Tip top Magoo. Stay black. Have a good week. And a great weekend. I love you motherfuckers. Kick this fucking mule